Welcome back, everyone. We're ready to start the next session, which is on the economic gains from equity. The authors are listed on the program, and the people will be presented by Mary Daly. Takes more effort than I would have hoped, but there it is. Okay, here I am. So uh, thank you. So this paper is on the economic gains from equity. My co-authors are Shelby Buckman, Laura Choi, and Lily Seidelman. And this is, so this is very much joint work. Now, when we started this paper back in the spring, we were fortunate enough just a few months later to attend a racism in the economy series that the Federal Reserve Banks host. And I was the moderator for a panel by, that, that hosted Bill Spriggs and Sendel Molly Nathan. And the striking thing about this panel, we were talking about the economics profession, how we look at the world, and they both made a challenge to economists. They said, the way that economists look at the world is we look outside and we say, everything we see must reflect some degree of optimal allocation. Maybe there are some areas of market failure, but mostly this is optimal allocation. And that leads us to, when we think about gaps between say blacks and whites or Hispanics and, and whites or men and women to conclude that there must be something going on that explains these gaps. And they both said, well, what if we took a different view? What if we instead looked out there and said, talent and interest and preferences are more or less distributed randomly across the population, but very evenly by race and ethnicity in this case, then we would have a whole different approach to how we looked at the problems that we needed to solve. And importantly, we would ask then, we would know that the gaps we see are most likely misallocation. Maybe the misallocation is a result of many years of, of barriers that have been in place, or maybe they're current, but they're a misallocation. And then if we were a social planner or an entrepreneur, we would simply reallocate and get more production. And it's that lens that we're going to look through. We're going to look through that lens. What if given talent and interest are distributed um, randomly, what if we were reallocating, how much more would we have? And this leads to our question, how much larger would the US economic pie be, aggregate GDP, if opportunities and outcomes were more equally distributed by race and ethnicity? Now, of course, we're not the first to, to look at this, and I just have a few papers here that we cite, but there are many more that we put into the actual paper. The, the reason I cite these three is that uh, the Peterson Mann paper is very recent and it finds that just closing gaps between blacks and whites, you can get 16 trillion more dollars in GDP over the last 20 years. And that's very similar to the Truff, Scoggins and Tran paper that finds you get 2.1 trillion in one year alone, 2012, if you eliminate gaps by race and ethnicity. And then the middle paper, the Shea, Hearst, Jones and Cleanout paper really completely innovative, takes a more structural model approach and then looks back in time and says, how much of the actual growth did we see over this period, 1960 to 2010, can we attribute to improved allocation because barriers were removed for females and, and black Americans? And these three papers find very large gains. And if you think about that, it's easy to understand why that would be inherently the case. And I wanna to point to two, two reasons. First is what I'm gonna call basic GDP math. Aggregate output Y is a function of physical capital and labor in the simple uh, solo representation. And if you hold capital and labor fixed, the relationship between them fixed or the capital labor ratio fixed, then the size of Y, this aggregate output, depends on the amount of capital and the amount of labor used. And you know, when you think about it, if, if labor is the more flexible factor, then as labor force changes, whether it's from an aging population, you know, from a baby boom or from closing gaps, then capital will respond. And this means that the gaps in labor market outcomes that we, we observe that sideline or underutilize either way, workers can translate directly into lower output. And conversely, closing those gaps can translate into higher economic output. So that's just the basic logic behind it. But you have to marry that basic logic with the, where are the gaps? And the gaps are sizable and persistent. And you can look across a range of indicators. If we did, a, we did do a meta-analysis of the work, you can find gaps documented in employment and hours and education or education utilization, how well people are aligned to the education that they have when they go out into the labor market or earnings. 
And I wanna just give you a couple of examples that if you're not familiar with these gaps and recently they're, they're really striking, let's just look at employment. And in all of the analysis we do, we use the current population survey data, and we're going to focus on men and women 25 to 64 to, to rid ourselves of the, of the movements from schooling or retirement to the best of our ability. Then we're going to, and we're gonna eliminate the self-employed just because of measurement issues in hours and employment and earnings. So we've got this very focused sample, and we're going to define race and ethnicity as non-Hispanic non -Hispanic black, Hispanic of any race, non-Hispanic white, and what we call API plus, which is Asian Pacific Islander and a variety of other uh, smaller ethnicity groups, racial groups that, that are just too small to, to independently investigate. So when we do that, look on the left panel, it shows the trends in employment rates for men 25 to 64. And one really striking fact just jumps out, and that is that the blue line, Black Americans, Black American males, 25 to 64, just have employment rates that are far below any other group in that population, any other men in, those in that age range. So and that's persistent, whether you're in an expansion or a contraction, the gaps narrow slightly in expansions, but they revitalize themselves right, right up again when there's a recession. And so the striking feature is just the persistence of the gap and it's large. In contrast, and it'll be interesting later in the analysis, Hispanic men actually work more, have higher employment rates, but as we'll see in, in other things, don't actually have better labor market outcomes in earnings from that, that, that higher employment rate. But that is a fact that they, they have higher employment rates. If you look to the, the, the right panel, females, you'll see that the trends are, are somewhat flipped, completely flipped actually. Uh, black women work about at the same rate recently anyway as white women, but Hispanic women have a gap in employment rates that persist throughout the sample. So those facts, those the size of those gaps and the persistence in employment just say, tell us that there's some opportunity to even up those gaps and have better outcomes, not only for the workers, but better outcomes for GDP. Another gap that's salient is educational attainment. And this is more of an input to uh, to the labor market success. And here the trends are, are striking and they're very similar across both, both men and women. Black and Hispanic Americans just have lower educational attainment than white or API plus. The API plus population actually has the highest level of educational attainment, but the black and Hispanic Americans just fall well below that. So there's another a, a persistent opportunity to close a gap and under and believe that this would result in higher productivity for those workers and a, perhaps a better allocation across, across the labor market. So if you put those two things together, then, and you ask the question, what if these gaps were eliminated? How much larger would GDP be? We're going to start with a very simple exercise, and I have to, uh, we have to credit Eric Hurst for giving us this idea. It, it's really the, the right way to start, which we started in the more complicated way and originally, and, and he encouraged us to, to take this other look, which we have. So let's go for the, what we call a simple pass. So we're going to just close aggregate earnings gaps here using the CPS data I just described and focus on 2019. And we're going to do a very simple calculation, but it, it shows the, what we're doing in, in, our more comp, in our more detailed analysis. The simple calculation is just split the populations into white, black, Hispanic, API+, plus. no distinction for gender here. Just compute the share of the population that's, uh, re, re, that is associated with each of these groups. Um, use that to multiply it by the population totally between 25 and 64, again, no, not self-employed, and then compute average annual earnings for these groups. And what you see specifically in this in the top panel is that white Americans have average annual earnings that are higher than black and Hispanic Americans. API plus is a little higher than whites, not that much higher, but a little higher. So then you can compute the group specific GDP contribution of earnings, the labor part of, of the GDP contribution by just taking the share of the population times the, the, the population itself in that age range, multiply it by average annual earnings and you get the, the group specific GDP. So that's the observed numbers. And then the counterfactual and what is the basis of our analysis is to just give Black and Hispanic Americans the same average annual earnings as whites. 
And if we do that, we simply recompute the group specific GDP and we get a new counterfactual uh, GDP contribution. And that then gives you a gain, if you difference those two, of $0.66 trillion in 2019, just from equalizing the gaps in earnings across those different racial groups. So that simple calculation is very consistent with what uh, the other papers that I've cited, the two empirical papers, less so the structural paper, does in, in the standard analysis. And it's really helpful if you thought about scaling this up to match the labor share and then scaling it up again to match capital, seeing capital dust adjust endogenously to the labor force, you would get a number that's very consistent with what you see in the, in the previous literature. So the second thing we do then is we take that simple analysis and we ask, well, what have the gains looked like over time? Have we, are we growing out of the problem, if you will? And the answer is no, we're not growing out of the problem. This is all in 2019 dollars. So these are the absolute contributions over time. And you see that over time, the, the gains have been rising, the gains from closing gaps. And this really comes from the fact that the gaps themselves haven't changed very much. You saw examples of that in the education and employment data that I showed, but it's also true that the share of the population that's, that is Hispanic has been rising over time. The share of the, the population that's of color in, our, in, our, uh, in the economy has been rising over time. So you combine those two features and you get rising gains from closing gaps between particularly Hispanic and black Americans and whites. So then what else is there left to do? And, and this, what the second part of the paper is, is what drives these gains? And the reason that we found this interesting is for several, several factors. First, these aggregate average earnings, we all know from other work that there's a lot of heterogeneity below that. And you might think that, that another way we could grow out of this problem is that younger workers are getting are better off. The gaps aren't as large. So that's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is we might want to know if we're thinking about policies, we'd like to know what's driving them. Where are the largest gaps and what are the biggest contributors if we closed uh, those gaps? So we're going to do those two things. We're going to look at a more micro level and we're going to divide the, the population in the CPS between 25 and 64 into 10 year age groups to try to control for these age uh, factors. Then we're going to divide by gender, race, and ethnicity. So we're going to have you know, these cells that are defined by say 25 to 34 year old black men and 25 to 34 year old white men, et cetera. Then we're going to close gaps in specific variables, looking particularly at employment, hours, educational attainment, and educational utilization. And we define educational utilization as if you've attained a BA degree, are you in an industry occupation pair that actually requires that BA degree in general. If you're not, you're underutilized, and if you are, you're properly utilized. So we're gonna close those gaps and we're gonna compute the gains to GDP from closing those gaps and call that Delta QT. Now, Delta QT, if you were thinking about a Oaxaca decomposition would simply be, it's computed as this. I move a black, black men, 25 to 34 years old, I move a fraction of those to from non-employment to employment to match the employment rate of white men 25 to 34 years old. And I price that move at the black wage for that group instead of the white wage. So I'm just saying you're going to, you're not getting adjustment for earnings gaps. You're only getting adjustment for moving from non-employment to employment priced at the black wage. That's Delta QT. Mary, you have two minutes left. Okay. So the, uh, but you know, you, that's not the only thing you want to do. You have to actually um, imagine that you, act, you have to control for average earnings gaps as well. So we do that for both those who move from, from one state to another, for instance, employment to, I mean, non-employment to employment, and also everyone else who did not move because they were already in the, the state employment or have the right, the average hours of whites or the educational attainment of whites. So we do that. And you can do a full decomposition then of GDP into Delta QT plus Delta ET. These are for treated. I don't think that's the optimal language, but it's those are the people who move. And then the, the untreated Delta EU. And if you do that, you get the following uh, contributions. You see that in 1990 and 2019, employment plays a large role. It explains in 1990, 26% of the total total gains, and in 2019, 19% of the total gains. 
Another big player is education. It, it's flipped from 1990 to 2019, but it, it played 20, it accounted for 27% of the gains in GDP in 2019, meaning closing gaps in, in education would give you a lot in terms of additional uh, GDP for the, for the country, for the nation. And then earnings play a role little less than half in both cases. So let me just do the final table then. So how do we think about this if we were to aggregate it up and get to the bottom line? Well, the first one is I do it three ways. Labor share contribution using CPS data is, let's just use 2019 given I have limited time, $0.79 trillion. But we know the CPS data doesn't add up to the labor share in 2019 for the economy. So we scale it by the NIPA and we get a contribution of roughly $1.4 trillion. But if we allow capital to adjust to the labor, to the growing labor contribution and we scale it up, then it goes to $2.6 trillion in, in overall. So these are big numbers, very consistent with what others have found. But the, the point is this, that if you accumulate this over a long period of time, and that's the second bullet point here, between 1990 and 2019, we would have had 51 trillion additional dollars in GDP from just closing these gaps. And I, the main point that we want to convey is this is not a zero sum game then about getting greater equity by taking the, the existing pie and spreading it out more evenly across the population. This is actually about growing the pie. And this means that equity is not simply a moral issue, it is actually an economic one. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, the first discussant is Nicole Fortin. That's good. Uh, uh, do I need to swap my screen? Or do you see the full screen? We see both the screen and the speaker notes. Yeah, that's not what I want. So I want to uh, um, switch this. Um, you can use the display settings at the top. I had practice for this, so that's uh, unfortunate. Uh, um, um, hey. you, you can also just leave it in this mode if you want, in the in the regular PowerPoint mode. Yeah, um, I use. You can see this. everything. Yeah, no, I I I uh, just want to switch. Uh, um, screens here, but somehow I don't see it. This mode works fine if you want to do it that way. Not sure exactly why it doesn't work. If you go, it's a, it's a show task bar that says display settings in the middle at the top. Which one? Display settings. Right next to it says a show taskbar, and that's a display settings in the in slideshow. No. Nicole, I can show your slides if that's easier. Um, um, we can. We can see your slides fine, Nicole, if you just want to use this, or we can project them from Brookings. Okay. Ah, there you go. It's not, it's not ideal, but uh, I have practice, so I'm sorry about this. So anyway, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for thinking of me for discussing this, this paper. As a labor economist, I will uh, bring a different perspective to the issue. Uh, let me say that this is a very timely and important paper. Uh, 2020 was not only the start of the pandemic, but also a reawakening and a widening of the protests against anti-Black racism. 
And um, economists have long been aware of anti-Black discrimination, but they've been many, some of them have been in denial because essentially uh, employers who would discriminate against Black by not employing them would be leaving money on the table. That doesn't make economic sense. And so, put it simply, can America afford to be racist now and more importantly in the future? So this is an ambitious question talk provoking paper. And naturally it has the question in a more positive way, uh, trying to simulate the impact of what would be uh, the labor outcome uh, if blacks and Hispanic had outcomes similar to white. Uh, focusing on employment, hours work, educational attainment and educational utilization. And they're asking which of these five factors is the one that contributes most uh, to the gains. And um, the answer is that employment and education uh, are the more important factor and that the gains are substantially larger in 2019 than in 1990. And so this is really the disturbing part about the finding that things have not improved over time, that they have gone south, if you will. And uh, when the um, all uh, minorities, if you will, their earnings, if they were priced at the white earnings, uh, the gains would even uh, be larger. So in my discussion today, I want to bring uh, the point of view of the labor economist asking which would be the policies that could uh, help uh, to uh, mitigate uh, those uh, discrepancy, or perhaps more importantly, which are the policies which have been eroded over time and have allowed the gap to be larger in 2019 than it was uh, in 1990. And um, so those types of policies are gonna be immigration policies, affirmative action policies and labor market institution namely uh, unions and uh, minimum wage. And um, so when we look at the definition of the racial groups that is used in this paper, uh, uh, we see that uh, the average earnings of blacks are uh, perhaps a little better than those of Hispanics and that those of the um, Asian plus are uh, perhaps a little better than uh, the whites. Uh, um, but um, if we think of um, equity issues, um, those that relate to immigrant workers will have to be different because many of these immigrants do arrive in the US in adulthood. They've completed their education. And many of those from Mexico and Central America have very low level of education and therefore when we look overall at their earnings, they're going to be lower and it's going to be a more difficult uh, thing to um, remediate than it would be uh, for their children. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, immigrants who come from large Asian countries because of the quota system are highly selected, highly positively selected workers. And so uh, there's an important role here. Uh, in the immigration policy, in this um, composition of the US labor force, and thus in the contribution to GDP. Uh, here, uh, um, these, uh, the, um, the impact of the considering foreign versus US uh, uh, born uh, um, workers is more important for the Asians and the Hispanic uh, um, more than half of them are foreign born among blacks. It's a much larger proportion than among whites. Uh, in 2010, about 14% of blacks were foreign born. And uh, when we look at the average earnings, um, the uh, ranking of the racial groups, if you will, uh, changes when we differentiate foreign born than US born. Among US born Hispanics do better than blacks, whereas among foreign born is the, it's the opposite. And uh, um, Asian plus among the US born do not do better than whites, whereas among foreign born, these two groups are very much equal. So there's a sense in which uh, using uh, the wage of the US foreign born would be a good benchmark uh, as is done in the paper because 
uh, foreign born among whites are, uh, are a relatively uh, smaller proportion. However, when here I express the ratio of average wage of these different groups as um, a ratio of the average wages of the white US born, uh, what uh, is clearly seen is that we have a second significant negative trend for black US born. So this is not the direction we want to go. So um, I want to offer some perhaps suggestion. This is just a stylized facts, however, about, um, in terms of what could have gone wrong in terms of policies. So here are my uh, graph of educational attainment for the different ethnic groups goes a little further back in time. And uh, what we see is uh, a slowdown. So here I differentiate uh, men and women. And uh, what we see is that the improvement in educational attainment for black men in particular have slowed down by half after 1996, which was the start of many affirmative action in higher education, many of these policies being banned in several large uh, states. So um, while naturally uh, education has to uh, be remedied at um, uh, lower education level uh, uh, for equity purposes too, uh, here we see um, a consequence of uh, the erosion of this uh, um, uh, policy. Another policy or labor market institution that disproportionately affects Blacks is a unionization rate. Uh, historically, uh, Blacks have had a much higher uh, unionization rates uh, than uh, um, the other um, racial and ethnic groups, more so among uh, Blacks uh, uh, than, uh, um, more so among men than among women. And more, not only did unionization rate decline, but it's also been the case that the union non-union gap by our uh, um, ethnic group um, has also declined more uh, for uh, Black Americans, the African Americans, than uh, for uh, the other groups. Um, so uh, um, we're talking here about workers uh, more in the middle range of the, dis uh, the distribution uh, that have been affected. But it's also the case that workers at the bottom of the wage distribution uh, uh, have been affected differently by uh, um, ethnic and racial groups. So following the uh, 2008 uh, recession, not only did the employment of uh, Blacks um, improve more slowly uh, than for uh, whites, but also uh, there were uh, twice as likely to be to become minimum wage workers uh, than the white counterpart. Here we have that the Hispanics are also more likely to be minimum workers, a minimum wage worker after 2010. However, Hispanics are concentrated in states uh, such as California, where uh, there's been uh, an improvement of state minimum wage in comparison to the federal minimum wage. So this means that in the years following 2000, uh, Blacks were more likely to be found in the bottom 25% of the minimum wage distribution. So again, another policy that uh, uh, is at play when we're thinking of uh, um, explaining those uh, um, discrepancy. So how to reach greater equity. Improvement in educational attainment, I think everybody agrees uh, that it's uh, a prime goal. Um, this applies more to the children of immigrants than the immigrants themselves, uh, but should begin with greater literacy and numeracy and naturally on education, we could have a, a very lengthy conversation. Um, on labor market institutions, uh, the erosion of these of unions and minimum wage have had more dramatic impact for black workers than other minorities. They're not coming back. However, in recent years, there's been further erosion of uh, um, uh, union power 
to uh, the implementation of more right to work laws. And some of them could be reversed or could be stopped. Uh, well, the wider support for minimum wage is out there. However, not so much in uh, some uh, states uh, um, where uh, Blacks are concentrated, such as uh, in the South. So this would require uh, federal action. So um, again, I think this is a very important, very timely paper. And uh, I'm sorry that my presentation did not, uh, um, did not work out. It was great, Nicole, thank you. We could see your slides just fine, don't worry. Uh, and the, the second discussant is uh, Eric Hurst. Hey, thank you very much. Um, okay, everybody good on my side? See, it's like, perfect. So, um, so as Mary mentioned, you know, the, the, the paper has two kind of statements it wants to make. One, the gains from equalizing labor market outcomes across groups are large, and those gains seem to be increasing over time. So I'm going to spend a minute just kind of reviewing kind of the key kind of findings that, that Mary did. And I'm going to make three comments after that on potential interpretation of, of, of some of the findings. So I have data uh, on my slide from the American Community Survey, not the CPS, but it's basically the same kind of structure as what Mary, Mary showed. The number is going to be a little different because the American Community Survey has people in, in the census and have people in group quarters, and that's going to change the percentages a little bit more. Um, and because those and change them over time, given that institutionalized populations are changing over time and doing so in a ways that differs by group. Um, but to a first approximation, my numbers are going to be roughly the same as, as what, uh, what Mary showed. So this is data from just 2018 uh, American Community Survey, same groups that, that, that Mary was looking at in her, in her presentation. And the key thing is, you know, I've kind of pooled all of income together as opposed to decoupling it in by, uh, uh, you know, employment rates and uh, hours worked and wages. They kind of decouple it into a components in the paper. And this, as Mary mentioned, I kind of urge them just to, all of that is just, you know, this is exactly the same numbers. It's just total income. And then you could decompose it into its components later on. So this is just total income. And the goal is suppose that other groups had the same total earnings on average, including the zeros as, as uh, white individuals do. And you get big numbers from doing that in 2019. Again, my number is like 0.9 trillion as opposed to 0.8 trillion. Again, because I have a little bit more um, differences with the institutionalized population in, in the American Community Survey, but it's about 12% of labor earnings um, uh, overall. And when you go back in time to 1990, you could do the same thing. The 1990 data across groups differs in three ways. First, the shares of the populations have changed over time. Mary, as Mary in indicated, um, the Hispanic share was much lower in 1990 relative to today, and the white share was much higher. The paper talks a lot about scale effects of how many trillions of dollars. So there is scale effects. The amount of labor in the economy was just a lot smaller in 1990 than it was in, in, in 2018. And then the relative incomes across groups didn't change much. They could have, and I'm gonna show you a little bit more. That's gonna be one of my comments in a second. They could have changed over time. They didn't change too much, but that's the three ways 1990 is different. So when you do the counterfactual in 1990, you get about 7% of labor income as opposed to 12% of in labor income occurs from equating earnings across groups. And as Mary mentioned, 100% of that is just due to the shares. So if we just in 1990 made the same shares across groups as we see in 2018 and redo the same analysis, it is gonna get 12% of labor income just because the Hispanic share will be larger and the white share will be lower. In, in, in 1990. So that's the takeaway of the paper. These gaps are large. If you equate income groups across, uh, across, or across, across, equate income across groups, and that gap has increased over time, predominantly because the share of the population um, that is not white has been growing over time. So I want to do three things in comments. The first is the discussion that this gaps 
across groups have been relatively constant uh, over time. I just want to show you one piece of data to, in a different set of units to kind of show the same fact. What this is, is wage war uh, rates of workers, um, white men versus black men over time. Again, in the census in the American Community Surveys, same age ranges-ish, um, conditional on age and education. And you can see large convergence in wage gaps between 1960 and 1980 but essentially no gain in relative wages. If anything, maybe a little deterioration, slight deterioration over the last 40 years. And so a lot of the pictures that Mary showed in the paper, they started in 1980 or 1990, but those gaps were relatively constant over time. And so how do we think about these relative gaps being constant over time? That's a point that I'm gonna talk about uh, in one of my comments. So let me just do the three comments first, and then uh, I'll conclude. I think this is probably my, the comment that I think is probably most important for us to ponder is when we're thinking about these gaps in you know, discrimination in general, are we thinking about distributional effects or reallocation effects? And so, as Mary said, you wanna talk about widening the pie or reallocating the pie. And so I just want to kind of touch on that and then get back to the redistribution point in, in, in a moment. So in the back of our mind is this idea that some barriers that exist for whatever reason, if people have the same amount, um, innate amount of talent, some barriers are preventing the allocation of that talent uh, in different ways. And that might be occupational choice. It might be the ability to accumulate human capital those barriers prevent. It might be whether we work or not. But in, by removing barriers, you get better allocations and the pie grows uh, in, in general. And so that's kind of, that was the focus of my paper with Chang and Pete and Chad was trying to kind of write down a model of people being the same at birth, having randomly distributed talent, but the distributions were the same across groups and how barriers could affect that. And by removing barriers, you get better allocations and, and uh, as a result, economic growth. But also in our paper, there was redistribution that was taking place. Those barriers were favoring some groups at the expense of others. And the fact, again, in our paper, we had both gender and race, but the fact that there was barriers potentially to being a doctor in 1960 for uh, black men and women and white women, that made white men better off. More of them got to be doctors and as a result, um, you know, get some gains from that. And so by removing barriers, you're also going to change redistribution. And so in our paper, again, it's a model, there was assumptions, but white men were made worse off by the reduction of barriers. So even though the pie grew by a lot, there was some segments of the population, it wasn't huge because the pie was growing, but there was a group, the majority that had no frictions became worse off as a result, despite the, the fact that the pie was growing. And again, when we're thinking about changing things going forward, we just have to realize that if the majority is gaining in the status quo, that's going to make changes hard. And that's a, the redistribution component that is going back in the, in the background. So despite the fact that GDP is growing, the gains are going to certain groups, not others. And the ones that are not uh, getting the gains tend to be in the majority, or at least in our paper with the white men. The second comment, this one's a quick one. There's nothing really deep in this comment, but I think it's at the essence of all of it, which is understanding where these barriers, why these barriers occur, occur is going to be critical for removing them over time. And how much of that is coming from current discrimination in a taste-based way? How much of it is coming from past discrimination and how much of it is coming from past discrimination that is spilled over to institutions? All of those are deep and important questions. And my answer is probably all of the above. But unless we understand that the gaps exist, we just look at the world, changing them, we have to figure out what is kind of the root causes of those. And just saying it would be nice to increase the education of some groups relative to others, it's a lot easier to say than to do. And then understanding where the root causes are, then we could start thinking about ways to, to, to achieve, uh, achieve a better allocation. And then the last comment I'm going to make is something just about, you know, which is in the background of the paper. Um, but I want to kind of bring it a little bit more to the forefront, is that these gaps are being constant over time. And does that mean the fact that the gaps were constant over time, that there wasn't 
improvements in ra you know we'll call it race or ethnic specific trends over time, declining discrimination or potentially narrowing of skill skill gaps. And the answer is not necessarily. And I just want to kind of touch, and I, I feel you know self grandize when to do this, but I have some new work I know exactly on this on this issue, which kind of talked about how the structure of the economy changing over time might have been masking some of the gains that were occurring to different uh, racial and ethnic groups over the last couple of decades of, of the paper. So uh, the, the couple of decades in the United States. So, so the paper is called task-based discrimination. Basically it's a task model of the world with frictions in task allocations. And what happens is, uh, and I'll show you one picture on this before I conclude that Black men, the paper focused on black men relative to white men. Black men were underrepresented in certain tasks in the labor market that's been constant over time. One of those tasks is going to be abstract tasks. And we know from the work of David Otter and many others that the return to those tasks have been rising. And in doing so, the rising return to abstract tasks have favored white uh, men relative to black men over that time period. And part of the reason why average wages were constant over the last 40 years is there was these two offsetting effects. The structure of the economy changing by rewarding abstract tasks made white men better off relative to, to, to black men, but narrowing of race specific factors um, had kind of favored black men relative to white men and those two effects were relatively offset during, during this time period. And again, why do I bring that up? It's when we start thinking about kind of projecting forward over time, there is race specific and ethnic specific forces that are going on in the background, but also the structure of the care economy interacts with existing barriers in ways that could favor one group over the other. And Jan, I'm almost finished. I'm just gonna show one picture and then, uh, and then I'm gonna conclude. And so what this is here is just a projection using the census and American community survey data of an individual's race on the tasks associated with the occupations to which they've sorted into. And the tasks that I'm measuring are gonna be abstract, routine, manual, just like David Otter and David Dorn and many others have done. And I'm gonna have one more, which I'm gonna de describe in a second. But the key thing, and again, this struck me when I was looking at this, this is condition on education already, that the racial gap and abstract tasks have been constant for 60 years in the United States. Okay, and the way you would read this is a one standard deviation increase in the abstract task content of a job reduces the propensity that an individual was in that task that was black by about three percentage points. And that's a pretty big effect. That wasn't the same for all tasks. So one task we had that we created for this is the extent to which uh, an individual has to interact with customers or coworkers as part of their jobs. We call this contact. We thought of discrimination was, what task would discrimination most be salient in? Maybe one where you have to interact with others. And you can see that has kind of started much larger in gaps in the 1960s, but there's been some changes in that over time. And if we kind of break that out by, oops, sorry, if we break that out by kind of region, on the left-hand side is the South region of the US, the left, uh, the right is all other regions. You could see that in both regions, abstract gaps have been relatively constant over time at different levels. But in the South, there used to be huge gaps in the uh, in tasks associated with interacting with others between black and white men in 1960. And that converged quite a bit uh, over, over time. And so in our paper, we kind of use this task approach to try to distinguish between different stories of frictions that are affecting black men and white men in, in, in the labor market. So that's all I want to say. So. This is my conclusion. Individuals from different groups are endowed with the same potential. We should expect to see labor uh, market outcomes that are similar. We don't, that's the world. Um, so the, where are these differences you know, coming from? We know they're quite large. We know that they've been kind of changing, uh, at least the gaps have been constant over time. The fact that the gaps could be constant over time could be offsetting different forces such as the structure of the economy changing and potentially uh, changes in race specific factors. But I think we all conclude at the end uh, that systematic efforts to improve labor market outcomes for non-white ethnic and racial groups will have important individual uh, and aggregate gains, even though if those aggregate gains might be concentrated on mostly in the groups to which the barriers uh, are facing. That's all I got.
Thanks, Eric. Um, I want to open it up for questions now, and we have uh, some quite a few hands up already, and then also one question in the Q and A. So let me start with uh, Larry Meyer and Carolyn Hawksby uh, for the first two questions. So, Larry, we will. There, you should be able to unmute. <clears throat> okay. Well, I love this. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I love this paper. Uh, sometimes we think about the issues of, of improving equality of opportunity in terms of values. Uh, but as economists, we know things like this can have important economic implications. Um, so I love this for setting that out. Uh, I don't know what the relative gain to the economy is, but maybe I'm following up on some things that Eric said. <clears throat> there are, <clears throat> resource allocation uh, aspects here. The proportion of unskilled workers uh, in the economy is going to decline and the proportion of skilled workers is going to increase. That means the relative price of products uh, with uh, uh, produced by unskilled workers is going to increase and the verse on the other side. Also, it has implication for relative wages. Uh, what's gonna to happen to uh, uh, the relative wage of college professors, go down presumably, uh, and similarly with other things. So uh, I think that um, uh, we need to think about, about, about this, who's gonna produce the goods that are now produced by unskilled workers, skilled workers, more skilled workers. And uh, uh, presumably, as their relative wage goes up, we'll see those. We'll see the technology change, so that we need fewer workers in that job. So robots, etc., and those have other implications uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Carolyn. Okay, so um, this is really Eric Hurst's comment one um, that I think my big. The most important thing that I was really working with when I was listening to this presentation was that there are increases in productivity because of the reallocation of talent to jobs. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't redistribution of income because you are, dis you are decreasing discrimination. I mean, particularly probably amongst uh, or for white men. And um, I just wanted to point out that this is an underappreciated point that was even made by Charles Murray in the bell curve, not trying to uh, uh, defend everything that's in that book. But when you reduce discrimination, you reveal the latent distribution of merit. And so it's not, it's, you can't just move everybody into being um, benefiting from uh, discrimination. And then finally, I wanted to make just a tiny, a couple of tiny points. These are not very important, but often we really overestimate how much changes in educational attainment have gone on. Uh, and that's because the changes in educational attainment, in, especially in higher education, are so concentrated in non-selective universities. It's a Walden University. It's the University of Phoenix. It's not not that Harvard has increased the size of its class a whole bunch. And so because those increases in non-selective colleges are very disproportionately among Blacks and Hispanics, when you move people from being, um, when you sort of equate Blacks and Hispanics to whites, you're almost always overestimating what equalization would achieve because, it, because uh, they're not the same quality education. So thanks, and, and thanks to the authors. This is a super interesting paper, really appreciated. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, Mary, do you and your co-authors wanna take a, a minute to respond? Those are, there's some related questions in there and, and maybe you can address them together, um, but we still have people with hands up. So I, I wanna get back out to the Q&A too. Well, I'll be really uh, uh, brief then on this. Let me just say one thing about this, that your app, everyone who's made questions and discussions, Eric and, and Nicole, all correct, that there are these, there are redistribution issues, absolutely. But the conversation very frequently is about this, redistribution on a constant pie, 
And the point of this paper is that this is redistribution in a growing pie, if we think about equalizing gaps, because we gain aggregate output for the economy. And so while there'll be this relative uh, rewards shift, that's the redistribution, it likely will not be an absolute reward shift. And I think even when we uncover the latent distribution, if the pie is rising, it's not like you get a nominal cut in your, your pay. You would if the pie was staying the same, but it's much more like you're getting a relative rebalancing. And that's a different conversation. It's one that still makes it hard. I totally agree with Eric. It makes it hard to make changes because people do like pecking orders. And if the pecking order is changed, that is, it's harder to make those movements. But it's, it's a different point. It's absolute versus relative. The other thing about the economy, you know, to Larry's point, I really do think that we've seen it. <coughs> we do look, we get our goods and services provided by the lower parts of the skill distribution from other countries, and we automate the services on things. So I don't, I think the economy is very dynamic. And if we got people better education and they got into better jobs, we would find a way to, to, to do those other parts of the, of the work. So I'll stop there. Um, let me, uh, uh, ask for questions from uh, Steve Davis and Austin Goolsby. So Steve. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> one question and one comment. Question is um, about your benchmark. Um, you don't really explain why the average white outcome is the right benchmark. I mean, why not the average Jewish outcome or the average white outcome in the state with the highest white earnings? So I'm not advocating those two, but I think uh, defending your particular benchmark would lend some greater conceptual clarity to the exercise and force you to confront issues which are now kind of uh, glossed over. And that leads to my second point. The paper, the, the presentation, and, and most of the discussion presumes that these average differences across groups um, are from current or past barriers, current or past forms of discrimination. That's far from obvious. Um, there's lots of evidence in the literature uh, that cultural different that there are big cultural differences that affect labor supply and human capital investment decisions across groups, that those cultural differences are transmitted intergener intergenerationally in the family, um, and uh, whether those you know, where do those cultural differences come from? Maybe they come from some past historical discrimination and barriers. Maybe they don't. Uh, that's an open question. Um, some of the best work on this regard that I'm aware of is by Raquel Fernandez and Alessandra Foley who uh, provide, I think, pretty con convincing evidence that um, preferences um, over fertility and labor force participation get transmitted intergenerationally within the family. Uh, obviously, fertility ha has implications for human capital investment in children through the standard quantity quality trade-off. Uh, preferences over labor, uh, la patterns of labor force participation also in affect incentives for human capital investment so I, I really think you need to at least uh, take a stand uh, on these issues and recognize um, the possibility, and I think the, the plausibility, um, that these average differences across ethnic and racial uh, and gender groups are, are not uh, necessarily uh, traced to barriers and discrimination. And that's not to deny a role for barriers and discrimination, but you're essentially claiming that that's everything. Um, without, without even trying to defend the assumption. Okay, let's take a question from Austin Goolsby and then give the authors uh, some time to reply. Okay, thank you. It's, it's obviously clearly an, an important um, paper and topic. I think in a way you, you, there's been a kind of a layering of complexity that I would like to unravel, which is to say GDP is just income. You could add up the, the GNI and the conceptual experiment of the paper is to start from the identifying assumption that if talent is equally distributed, then in some sense, everybody should be able to match whatever the, the, the white distribution is. So if we could raise national, if we could raise the incomes of other groups to the level of whites, that would expand national income and we can add up how big is that. But I do think that the, um, I do think that the comments of, of my colleagues, Eric Hurst and Steve Davis are quite relevant in whether you should accept that number at face value. One style of argument says, how would you raise the incomes of groups? Would you do it by 
increasing education? Would you do it by in, uh, changing the, the skill mix, changing the industry? If you did that, it wouldn't really, um, it wouldn't really be just raising incomes because you would have a general equilibrium rebalancing of a whole bunch of things and some people's incomes would go down. Uh, and then the other is the what's the relevant comparison group. So if you look in the census, Indian American median family income is $127,000 a year. It's more than double the median income uh, of, for the overall US. So by the same identifying assumption that talent is equally distributed, we could double national income if, if everyone could just be set to that level. And once you recognize that that's that that benchmark issue, I think I think it's worth thinking through a little bit. Is that the is that the relevant comparison? Okay, we have a limited amount of time left, so I want to turn back to the authors and give you a chance to uh, comment on some of the, the comments or and reply to them as well as the uh, discussants. So Mary and, and I know all the, the co-authors are are here as well. Okay, so well thanks and, and my co-authors are here, but I, I think they'll they'll give me the honor of, of responding. So so Austin and, and Steve, uh, you know, I it, it's not that I disagree with you about the benchmarks. I understand we've got to get these things right, but the exercise is really this. And so that and Steve, I'm I'm gonna take issue a little bit with the cultural kinds of concerns. So I, I understand this work. I've read this work. I can see that those are our our explanations we want to pursue. But I think it is too easy to accept the world that we have today. Imagine that it was all that what we see is because people had active choice in all of this, as opposed to you know historical barriers just pass through to generation after generation, and ultimately they become costly. And so the exercise that we're really trying to do is this one: the share of the U.S. population that is Hispanic is growing. The the Black Americans their population share hasn't changed. They're, that's going to be a sizable fraction of our overall population. And if we don't think hard about solving some of these inequities that are there, we're going to have less. And those are fewer taxpayers, more people who need public benefits in order to, to, to manage themselves. And so while this might be a redistributional loss for the majority group, the ultimate problem is that we're gonna be actually trying to divide a shrinking pie, one that's not or not one that's not growing as quickly as we're accustomed to. And this is the point of the paper that that is trying to quantify just what how much we're leaving on the table. Now why why did we choose the the whites as the as the group for the benchmark? I think that's largely because that's a the majority part of the population. So if you were thinking about what's the non-discriminatory wage, you would think of maybe the white population, not the Indian American, not the others. That's why we chose it, but we can do a much better job, point taken, much better job of, of, of thinking about those things in the paper and making that clear. But the exercise, if I can leave everybody with one point, the exercise isn't to give you a number that you should take out and say, okay, this is the number. And if we just do this, everything will miraculously be better. It's to just recognize that the world we have is one which is, it's a constrained optimization, essentially. We've sidelined a lot of people. We have a lower labor force participation rate than most industrialized nations and fewer people working. They have the same aging issues as we have. So if we activate our labor force, get people into positions, I think this is why the, the, the Shea et al. paper was so, or Eric and his colleagues was so instrumental. That is a general equilibrium approach and you still get the impact. I'll leave it there. Jen, you're on. Thanks. I got it. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Uh, thanks for those comments and, and for wrapping up. I know there's a, a few people who wanted to ask questions and, and Eric has his hand up, but let me ask you to put those questions into the Q&A. You can also put comments in there, uh, which everybody will be able to see. So if there's uh, unmet demand for a conversation, we can, we can carry it on uh, in the Q&A. So we have a five minute break here and then we'll come back to the next paper on credit programs. So thanks to the authors and both discussants. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.